Hey, this is Brent with Beach RC and JQ Racing USA. You're listening to the No Name RC Podcast with Lefty the Great. And I'm here to tell you that pink pinions matter. Nitro is the glory. Welcome to the No Name RC Podcast with your host tonight, Keenan White, aka Lefty the Great. And if you are unlucky, the Finnish village idiot, JQ. This is the RC Podcast with no name, but plenty of content. So sit back, relax and get ready for some serious bench racing. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the No Name RC Podcast, Episode 7. It's your main man, Lefty, and we got Brent Densford with us tonight. I decided to bring Brent on because he's a very good friend of mine. We work together daily on a daily basis. He's doing great things there at Beach RC, one of the best f- facilities on the East Coast, awesome track. Just had a really big race at INS 8 that he's so, like, he's well chuffed about that. So we're going to talk to him today get his opinions on things in RC, um, and a lot of other things. So it should be good. But before I get on to the interview with Brent, I wouldn't even say it's an interview. Before I get into the chat with Brent, I want to say thank you to all of our supporters at the No Name RC Podcast. I've been getting messages, people saying they like the podcast. We're almost at 1,000 likes on Facebook. Let's try and get that done before Christmas. Uh, we have some exciting things in the works for our, for all of us reporters, but especially our Patreon supporters that are donating, even if it's just $1 a month. It's something. It helps. Helps get us new equipment, get new programs. We're looking to get some swag to do some giveaways. We have, probably have some cool things coming up here shortly in t- January to give away. So if you, wanna, if you like what we're doing, you want to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash the quaygrain. Thank you to Fast Race Shot. They've come on for our 10 question, 10 second segment, which is going pretty good. I like it. Remember, if you go to fastraceshop.com, put in Lefty2019 in all caps, you get 10% off your purchase. One of the reasons that I wanted to start this podcast is I kind of got into podcasting after hearing Jason Rona and Kirby Hands. The RIP podcast, Radio Impound podcast. It's it's pretty old. It's It's got about 200 episodes, and they do a really good job. Jason Rona is really good ex- at explaining things at races and what's going on in the industry, and his knowledge is immense compared to mine. He is an icon in, in the industry, and he him and his company put a lot of money and time back into the industry, and I like that. So... I listen to that religiously, as well as a few other podcasts, TSR with Tim Smith. Uh, I really like On the Term with Mark Santa Maria, Lupus Live with Bobby and Jeff. My buddy uh, Matt Hausen also has one, MBM podcast. My buddy Aiden, Extra Lap out of England. Uh, there's another one I listen to. It's called uh, The State of RC. That's out of the UK, too. Uh, there's another uh, one that... Uh, uh, she's, uh, I think she's out of North Carolina. It's a lady, Mrs. Katie Carmendi, I think. She started a podcast. Um, I think she's going to do a few more episodes. I, I can't remember what. Uh, it's called Race Like a Girl, I think. I'm not sure. But uh, I think the more podcasts that we have, the more exposure our hobby sport gets. So keep up the good work, guys. I appreciate all the support that I've gotten for the No Name RC podcast. So a lot of you might be like, well, where did the, the whole no name come from? Well, I was kind of, Joseph and I were like, I, he wanted to call it this and I wanted to call it that. And I was like, dude, let's just call it the no name RC podcast. It's like a car with a, a white painted body with no stickers. No, just it goes out there just to do laps and, and have fun. So that's kind of what I compare it to. So hence the no name RC podcast. Lefty, Lefty the Great. All right, you're probably saying, who's this guy, Lefty the Great? Well, I'm originally from Bermuda, but I live in the Dominican Republic. I've been into RC for over 25 years. Um, I was fortunate enough to travel back in the early 2000s to races in America and meet a lot of cool people. Uh, I actually am called Lefty because I got in a bike accident and uh, my left arm 75% paralyzed. So Dagani was just fascinated by that when I met him at Fall Brawl. 
And he just said, we're going to call you Lefty from now on. And it kind of stuck. So, you know, and I just put the grade on it because, you know, I kind of have to deal with Joseph on a daily basis. And to be, to deal with Joseph on a daily basis, you have to be great. But it's no, I'm not trying to brag about myself. I'm just a normal guy. I'm just lucky and fortunate to be working in the industry. It's a lot of work. I appreciate it. I appreciate the people I get to meet and share this passion of RC. Well, um, 2019 is looking good for, for the No Name RC podcast. We've got a, uh, another great guest lined up for just before Christmas. And then I guess we'll take a break for Christmas, New Year's. Uh, we'll do a silly season podcast. And once we know all the moves that people are making, because I hear so many different rumors every day, I don't know who's going where. And a lot of the drivers, I think, are waiting until they make their choices before they come on the podcast. So it'll be good to have them on the podcast and ask why they made their decisions if they move. So 2019 should be great. I'm going to be cracking. I'm probably, we might even go to two podcasts a week, you know, or at least one a week and maybe an extra two every month. We'll see. Lots of information coming up. Season starting. It's going to be great. Um, I don't know. Let's get on to Brent. Uh, one day, maybe I'll do a podcast and tell you more about me. You know, I'm, I'm nobody, but I enjoy, I have a story to tell too. And that's another thing I wasn't, it's our podcast is not just going to be top stars in the industry. We want to get the average guys in too, because they have a story to tell as well. And we, we know, we all like to have fun and go racing and do RC things. And I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day is to have fun. So if you're having fun, if you aren't having fun, it doesn't make sense doing it. So, yeah. But anyway, guys, uh, enough of me rambling on. Shout out to all my JQ family once again. You know, I love all you guys. And shout out to Brent and Beach RC for all the work that they do. Let's get Brent Dance for the one and hear what he has to say. Let's talk about his INS rate, INS 8 race. So with that said, let's get Brent on. Welcome, Brent. How you doing, man? Good morning. What's up, Keenan? How you doing, buddy? It's lefty when I'm on this one. You gotta oh, go left. lefty's a great, my bad. No, you know, I, I don't know. I gotta, that's my, my alter ego, you know? So I got it. It's definitely alter, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So how you doing, man? How's Myrtle Beach today? I'm good. I'm good. I got a crick in my neck. I told you I've been complaining about it for two days, but you no, know, it is what it is. Um, it's raining, so it's a little muggy outside. Feels like it's been raining all dang year, but um, everything's good, man. Life yeah. is good. Yeah, it started raining when we was at Fall Row two weeks ago, and it like just seems like it hasn't stopped. It hasn't, man. It, it has been a super rainy year, and. Uh, I'm hoping that this is not indicative of what to look forward to over the next year or two. Yeah, the the East Coast has really suffered this year with their racing, man, with the rain and they had a hard, a long winter and now it's winter again. So, you know, I, I definitely think an indoor eight scale track is needed on the East Coast somewhere within where, where everybody can get to. So, yeah, I think that would be uh, a bonus. I know there's the, the one up in uh, uh, Adrenaline up a little north of us in Virginia, yes, I think or West Virginia, it's up there. But uh, yeah, a really good or at least a covered a scale pavilion or track down here would would go over real well. Yep, yep, yep. Hey, where's Lucas? Is he up? Is he in work at work today? Uh, it's a little early for Lucas yet, but uh, when he gets in here, we'll we'll put him <laughs> on for a minute. All right, that's my boy. I gotta get him on the podcast. <laughs> so you, you need to have a podcast with just Lucas. I mean, that that guy right there will. Uh, Oh, I, I know. think people people get a kick out of him. I'm, I'm going to do that because like a lot of people think like this podcast is not just about getting like the top guys on and, and talking with them, which is something that I want to do. Um, but I also want to get like the regular guys who, who who really support this hobby and that race and are passionate, you know, because I'm one of those guys, too. So, I mean, I don't race anymore, but, you know, we know how Look that goes. He's a trip, man. He's the kind of guy that uh, he can provide a perspective to um to everybody that maybe a lot of times we might think it but he's gonna say it he's one of those kind of guys oh, yeah. um but he he's he, what's so awesome about lucas is he doesn't aspire to be a pro or to to get paid or you know he loves the hobby he works in the hobby he loves club racing he doesn't want to travel he loves the badlands he loves racing here and he really has 
no ambition of like traveling unless, you know, it's for work and, and we're taking the trailer around or whatever. But he's the epitome of what the hobby really needs, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, Lucas is great and uh, you definitely should plan something with him. Like he would be a, a hoot. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. But for those of those that don't know who you are, you're Brent Densford. Uh, you, you're the owner of Beach RC. Also, you have your brand Assault RC, which you're, you're, you've been working on over this year. And and now, you know, the last six months, you've become the JQ Racing USA distributor, which we'll touch on later. But I want people to know, like, like I know uh, uh, briefly about your history. I, uh, I want to know, like, where you're from? How did you start in this? And, like, how'd you end up in Myrtle Beach with a, one of the baddest-ass 10-scale tracks on the East Coast? Well, you know, I'm... I'm originally was born in Tucson, Arizona, um, but I no, at a Tuxin, young age. Tucson, it's Tucson. Tucson, yeah, whatever. It's yes. it's out there, southwest. Um, but I was born uh, there in in at a young age. Um, I moved to Colorado, uh, up in the mountains, and went through high school and stuff there. Um, you know, I, I raced something my entire life, so we were always finding something to get into. Uh, but my friends and I, we had to. Uh, we had to travel to Denver down to Chad Brockman's place, which it was his parents' place at the time, uh, more RC down in Aurora. And um, we would, that's about an hour and a half drive through the mountains. A lot of times we get hit in blizzards and all kind of stuff just to drive down south. It's, it's where Dustin Evans is from. And, mm-hmm. um, but it was it's just a cool little place. It, it taught us how to race. It, it was back when, you know, you're barely able to get four minutes out of a a NICAD battery and discharging, having four or five batteries per, per time you went. It was not as much fun as it is now as far as that side. But so I, I learned to run there and I had a, a long hiatus when I moved from Colorado out to Myrtle beach. Uh, I moved around a lot, racing motorcycles and, um, around the country. And what type of motorcycles did you race? Uh, I ran, um, Four wheelers and and speedway bikes. Uh, we we did um, oval track, uh, mostly on ice. Oh really? And, yeah, we did motorcycle ice racing and uh, traveled the country for many years. Um, every weekend, sometimes two or three shows a weekend, um, in in arenas, hockey arenas around the U.S. and Canada and Puerto Rico. So did that for a while. I didn't know that about you, honestly. I did not know that about you. Yeah, man, that was. Uh, that was a good part of my life. I started doing that uh, full time in '99, and um, we moved to Myrtle Beach in '99. And I got hurt real bad in 2000. Oh yeah. And so that kind of slowed me down, kind of put me in a, a different state of uh, of life where I had to, you know, kind of rethink things professionally and whatnot, and got into graphic design and um, doing sign work and vinyl and stuff like that. Um, my father and I, we had a, a fab shop. I started racing go-karts again. Um, out here, dirt oval go-karts is the real big. And we, we, we had our own fab shop. We were racing, uh, another chassis in a different brand. And we started like, why don't we build our own chassis? So we build our own chassis. Next thing you know, people are asking for them. And, um, so we, we started a company, uh, building racing go-karts with a full fab shop. And, um, that business kind of started taking a turn in my opinion for the worse. Um, I know it's strong right now, but there's a few major players and we got out due to the cost of, uh, of racing and sold the business. And, um, that's, that's about the time, uh, my wife, my, my current wife moved out here to, uh, South Carolina and I worked from home for a while, just chilling, man, doing graphic design waking up in the morning playing call of duty doing a few hours of work making enough money to live just wasn't really satisfied with what i was doing um kind of got bored a lot of people would think that that uh, that's what they want but if you're if you're really like me and you're you would like to do things and be active and grow a business or you know a true entrepreneur then sitting around your house getting by and playing video games you know it's not the it's not the fun thing to do. So yeah, I can I can vouch for that. But by the way, which Call of Duty did you like the best? Because I'm I'm a Call of Duty fan. 
Um, honestly, the the World at War was my favorite one. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool too. I was hoping that the the newer the the last uh, one that just came out was going to be pretty good. But to be a hundred percent honest, I never even played it once because uh, I even pre ordered it. <laughs> I didn't even go buy it. I, I pre ordered it and I didn't even go pick it up. I I just don't have time. I haven't played a video game in almost four years, which is not a bad thing. But you don't have do time, know. dude. You don't have time to do that stuff. I don't. But uh, then my wife and I, we were uh, we wanted to to have a baby, and we uh, planned out our, our 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 child and had it. And uh, and just so happens, I was like, this is the time of my life where you know it's kind of make it or break it. Let's you know. You know, shit or get off the pot type of a situation. And I told her, I was like, I, I really want to do this. I wanted to do it from a young age ever since I started going to more. Uh, my best friend and I, uh, we used to talk about it all the time. Like, we're just going to grow old, have a hobby shop, eat donuts, drink coffee, and play with toy cars. But he's up north making a lot of money doing something different, and I'm down here. So uh, I opened up the first shop, Beach Hobbies, as we call it here, 1.0. And um, it was in a little 5,000 square foot building at about a, I think it was like 800 square foot of that was showroom. We had um, like a little 1,200 square foot dirt track and then there was a wall in past the dirt track and then we had a little carpet oval track in the back. And uh, we only had enough pit tables and room in this building to like fit 25 or 32 people or something like that. It wasn't much. But um, I knew for... For this business and, and to the model to succeed, we had to get a bigger track, bigger building, appeal to a broader audience. And, um, you know, no one would travel in to race with us. Obviously, I wouldn't expect them to with our old track. And uh, we just got so lucky to find the building that we're in because it, it was a it was a thing of chance. A uh, little short story within my story. We were, we were driving around, and this is a lesson to anybody that's interested in this kind of stuff. We were driving around, my wife and I, on a Saturday afternoon looking for buildings, trying to find them in good locations. Mm -hmm. And we found, we found the building we're currently in, and we were driving by, and there's like a sign on the window. And we're kind of like, well, are they evicted? Are they, you know, why is there paper on the window? And we went and read it, and the owners of the building, it used to be a baseball training facility. Yeah, that would explain the hat over the front yeah, the hats cool. I still haven't painted. God almighty. I catch so much crap over that. So they, um, there was a, a note on the door, and I, I went and looked at it, and it said, uh, on vacation, be back in a week. So I was like, okay, you know, family-owned business, on vacation. Well, we came back a week later, and the sign was still on the door. So I called and left a message with the company, and, and I just just on a whim, I was like, hey, you know, told him my name. I said, uh, I don't know what you guys are doing with, you know, if you close down or what, but if you ever decide to get to move out of this building, please call me first. Like this is perfect building for the business that I have. Um, and just so happens a week later, the guy called me. He's like, look, dude, we're shutting the doors. He said, I got, I got, I think he said six or seven months left on my lease. Um, you know, maybe we can work something out with the landlord. Long, you know, to, to finish that story up, we uh, we basically took over his lease and got him out of his lease, and um, just just because we we asked, you know, we if we wouldn't have asked, we would have missed it because if he bailed out and they put this place up, it would have been gone before we could have even blinked an eye at it. For sure, man. So I, I always that, say, man. sorry, I always say, people's like, hey, if you do not ask, you shall not receive. So absolutely. Either Absolutely. they can say yes or no. What's the worst they can say? We were just we, – we weren't even – like it wasn't like we were ready to move. Um, we we right. weren't we weren't in a position just to pick up and move. Um, you know, we had to make a lot of sacrifice to get into this building. Um, you know, I debted myself pretty good. I sold mm -hmm. my Harley to, to build all the interior walls. You know, I, I had to get rid of some of my, my luxury and pleasure to, to make this happen. But, you know, when it's all said and done, what how much – how much was I going to enjoy that stuff knowing I was going to be working the, you know, the amount of time. So yep. sacrifice, man, it's all about sacrifice. It's something that uh, people don't really comprehend. They think everything's given to people and they don't realize the, the work that goes into doing something. I've, as I've said on 
previous podcast. So you have this awesome facility. If you haven't been to Beach RC, it's it's probably I would say it's the OCRC of of the East Coast because that's probably one of the the best um, indoor ten scale track in California on on the West Coast. But I mean, you have a fully stocked hobby shop that caters to racers and bashers. So, I mean, I think it's great. I, I was shocked when I went in there the first time. But how did it go from? Tell us about your track because I know you said you like when it got special dirt and you had all this planned out. Like one thing I've learned about you, you're very methodical. Like you don't do things on a whim. You plan things. So, you well, know. you know, most of the time, yes, you're right. We you got to plan. I don't like I don't like unknowns popping up too often. Try to be uh, try to cover our you know our backside and the bases as, as best as possible, but. Um, to to go onto the dirt, we we just got real lucky with the dirt. That's one of the misconceptions, you know. There's there's people out there that search for dirt. They're they're out there. They're trying to. I will, I'll never forget um, Scott Speed and TJ Bell coming down to look at our dirt, and they they had done a ton of research. This is when they were changing out the dirt up at Speed RC, um, but they they done a ton of research on their dirt and how much sand versus um, you know clay or or whatever the, the, the base was. And, and so he, he wanted to come get a sample of our dirt so he could have it tested. And I mean, we just got so lucky that the pit that our dirt comes from is 15 minutes from here. Mm. And when we were building this building, I didn't really think too much about, Hey, there's a bunch of different kind of dirt. And a friend of mine's like, Hey, there's a pit right up the road. A buddy of mine digs it. He said, uh, I can probably get it for you real cheap. And I was like, well, that's what I want. Cheap dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, we got, you know, it was like 420 yards of this dirt and, and we cleaned it. We got all the stumps and whatever out of it. And, um, it, it was one of those processes where you're like, I didn't even think about that. It was going to be great dirt. And, um, to this day, we've never put any chemical on it. No glue. The only chemicals that are in it are come off of tires um, it's not easy to work. Uh, I will tell you that it, it's very hard to work. Um, the Badlands has a little bit of this dirt out in theirs and they don't like it too much because, because of how hard it is to work. Mm -hmm. But, um, it holds together. Amazing. The traction level is, uh, out of this world. I think, uh, anybody that was, you know, all the pros that were here this last weekend, um, the only one that had been here, well, obviously Max, because he lives in North Carolina, but Dustin Evans had been here the last two Masters of Dirt. He's the only one out of all those pros that really knew um, what to expect. I mean, this dirt after practice is done is like super asphalt, super grip. Really? Yeah, but it's crazy though. You can still push down and make dimples with your fingers. I mean, it 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 it, it holds moisture. It doesn't break up. It has massive traction, and um, and it doesn't take long to get it. You know, Thursday practice that we had for the INS. Two hours into it, it was it was people were biting and, and rocking and rolling. So, yeah, but, and, yeah, and you don't have like fancy uh, uh, misters and all that type of stuff either. So, it's no, just, we just don't. water and and building and packing. Yeah, we water it heavy once a day. Um, in the summertime, we might have to water it. You know, every few hours, just kind of mist it, get the top layer wet, but. Um, you know, I, would I want misters? Yes. I, I think the misters could help for maintenance and, um, and whatnot. I, I think the way that OCRC does their track out there is amazing. They're, yeah. uh, they're a gold standard. And I think most of us look at them as a, a place for ideas and concepts and they, you know, they're very innovative and Nick and RB and them, they, they do a great job. So, uh, it's, it's a honor to even be considered, you know, in that category, um, just because those guys, you know, put in so much work and do such a great job. Yeah. So you opened up, uh, this beach 2.0, uh, what, what year was that? How long has that been around now? Um, well, we're in our fourth year here. We just finished our fourth year. Um, so I guess it would be around 2014. Let's see. 15, 2015, November 2015. Yeah, I, I just think like also your your track is located in one of the coolest places. It's like located in an actual tourist area, like where most tracks are located in the middle of, you know, like the middle of nowhere. You're actually like in a prime real estate 
in, in South Carolina. Do you see, <coughs> excuse me, during tourist season, do you get people coming in to the hobby shop and, and, and trying out and maybe renting cars from you and going on the track? Or does that, like, I, I don't know if that affects your business or not. Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's one thing we have a leg up on a lot of hobby shops in this country. Um, we're, uh, we do very good in the summer. A lot of hobby shops struggle in the summer. You know, they, um, I remember when I was opening up my first shop and, and I was talking to Chad Brockman, he says, look, he says, your winters are going to be good. Save that money. It's going to have to help you to get through the summer. Um, you know, because a lot of the hobby, you know, most places, people that go inside, they go outside for the summer. And if you don't have a way to, you know, to, to offer your customer an outside experience, they're mm -hmm. not going to come to you. So we, um, we advertise in a lot of these coupon books around here and anyone that's been here knows like you can go and pick up a monster coupon book and, um, they're free and they're at every gas station, every hotel, every restaurant. And we, uh, we do rental coupons and, and, and add in there. And, and those, I mean, the rentals in the summertime here are amazing. Like there'll be a line of people waiting for cars while all of our cars are out on the track. No way. Yeah. That's so crazy. we, uh, we do real well, um, for the most part with that. It, it translates into sales too. A lot of people, you know, they buy, they'll buy something to take home or play on the beach with or whatnot. So I think that's a, that's an advantage we have over a lot of, a lot of other shops and and it's a good situation for us you're right i mean we're right dead smack in the middle of myrtle beach the the beach is like less than a mile mm -hmm. so i wonder if that actually helps uh i wonder if people that come to your track enjoy it and actually get into the hobby because i think that's a i wonder if it's a gateway for people like have you have you met anybody that probably started at your track and they probably went home and then contacted you later and said, hey, man, I got started at your track. And I'm like full bore into the hobby now and I live in Idaho somewhere. Well, no one's ever told me that, but I can guarantee you that there's been a lot of people that have left here with vehicles or went home and because we'll, we'll help them find their local hobby shop here. Mm -hmm. They get excited and um you know, that's one thing we always preach is to, we, we want to see more racers. We want to see more people in the hobby. So we do whatever we can to help people do that. But I'm sure uh, the one thing we notice is like people always come in and they're like, oh man, we didn't know you guys had this awesome track. Uh, you know, if I would have known, I would have brought a, a vehicle with me to run on your track. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we notice the next year that they come down, they, they bring their stuff with them. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it, there's, it's, it's crazy how many people there are in this little underground niche hobby, um, but they're everywhere. And yeah. uh, the one thing we, we've been missing out on is a uh, crawling track. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we started building one in March, and then the rains came this year. And we literally have had rain more rain this year than I can remember since living here. Yeah. And I've been here almost 20 years. So they, uh, we're, we, our goal is to get our, our uh, crawler course done at some point. Um, February, March this year. Where would you put that to out on the on the side of the building, right there? Uh, it's it's, it's going to be in the back around the mm -hmm. pond, and um, you know it, we've we've got a little bit of open land in the very back before the drainage ditch yeah. that we have. So I, I mean, I love trailing. I mean, I think it's awesome. I I I watch. Um, I'm I'm a geek like that. I like anything that's RC related, but I really like trailing. I know it sounds like counterproductive to to racing RC cars. But trailing so awesome and making the scale trucks and I think it's the, probably the big the the fastest biggest growing portion of our of our four wheel industry. That's what, how I'll put it. So, with that said, I always like before I knew you, I used to watch you. You so you was very active on social media. You mean I mean you literally I believe I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not crazy, but I believe you had like a monster truck parked outside your your your, your um. Your hobby shop before? Or am I seeing things? No, you're not seeing things. We uh, we had the X Max monster truck here one time for the. Uh, there was a monster truck show here, and they come parked it out, and we had the the, the driver here, and um, yeah, I mean, we we were very active, and and I and I plan to get more uh -huh. more active this year. Caught caught me way off guard. We had so much stuff going on, so yep. Um, that's the one thing. I love about this hobby is uh, there's a lot of people active in social media and 
we like that trend. Um, yeah. we like, we like that, that phase of it. And I think you're going to see a lot more of, uh, beach hobbies yeah. and the social media, um, again, doing videos and lives and stuff like that. Yeah. You was doing that, um, quite frequently a lot before people were really doing it. I remember that. And I was like, who's this guy? Like it's months of truck parked up there. This, you know, <laughs> I didn't know who you was like, so that's crazy. Um, moving on because I know, um, it's been a really busy year for you. I mean, we met this time last year at Fall Bro. And uh, I'll never forget when I met you. It was funny because I had uh, Joseph had asked you to save some parts for us. Well, not parts, some tools for me. And I came in. He was busy, like just busy. And you took some time to talk to him. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you heard for the, some Joseph told me about some tools. And I was like, yeah, we got to talk. And he goes, hey, you know, you have to have a, a shot of fireball before you leave this the, the truck, the van, like the trailer. And I was like, what the? What in the hell is this fireball? Oh, man, is that your printer going off? Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's done. All right. I was like, what the heck is this fireball crap like? You know, I never tasted that stuff in my life. And then you made me have a few shots. And then we had too much of it at the Nationals. And you know what? I'm not drinking that stuff ever again. So. But I mean, I just like, <laughs> I, I felt comfortable with you one time. Um, I thought that was a great way to get people to, to come to your to your van, I mean, to your trailer. And that's what, like, you treat people good, they come back and help you. Like, so I event, that was my first experience with you. Like, right off the bat, I was like, yeah, I like this guy. So, well, I, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we like to have fun, man. That's one thing that we're all about is having fun. So, oh, I know. If you, if you don't like to have fun, you definitely, you know, don't like what we're doing. That's that's what we're all about. Yeah. But um, before we go on, because it's another story to that. But before we go on to that, I want to touch on because what your real passion in RC, I think you've told me over and over, is dirt oval. And you actually ha hold a, a really big dirt oval race at your track. Once a, Is it once a year that you do it or I can't? Yeah, it's once a year. It's called the Dixie Nationals. Right. And um, – it's uh, it's been a growing event every year. Um, dirt oval oval period has always been my passion. I grew up in it. Um, I, I just I, I I've always understood it much better than um, than off road. Um, but that doesn't discount my uh, my passion for the off road side of things. I just I'm just uh, not as good at the off road stuff as I am the the oval. Mm -hmm. I mean, your cars look great. I mean, little snowflaked out, matching. And um, I I got my first taste of dirt oval a few months ago when I was in North Carolina. And Mike Hill and I went up to watch some, some oval racing on a Wednesday night. And I couldn't believe how many people were there racing. And I was like, wow. Like, I, it's, I mean, and it was fun. I mean, I always kind of like never really paid any mind to it. But now that I've seen it and I've been talking to you, I watch and see how big it is. Like on the East Coast and, and like in the middle of, Amer of America and whatnot. So I definitely think it's also a great gateway f to get people into off-road racing eventually. Well, what I understand from the people that I uh, – the oval crowd most of the time is a little bit older. <laughs> and uh, I, I've heard it explained as it's where off-road racers go to die. So, <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's – it's definitely a different discipline, um, in, in there, it's very kind of set in its ways. There's not a lot of change in oval. Um, I think there needs to be some, some change in oval. Um, like they've been doing four minute qualifiers, four minute mains forever. You know, like we need to, it's one of those things I'd like to see change to maybe, you know, four minute qualifiers and six or eight minute mains, something to try to separate one, one race from the next and, I, I, it's, it's so fun. I love it. It, the first time I ever did it and had success, um, uh, I explained it as like having a heart attack every five seconds for four minutes. I mean, <laughs> it, it's so intense and, and you, you gotta train yourself to breathe. You gotta, you just gotta be prepared to, to shake and breathe hard and, and almost pass out if you're, you know, once you start doing good. Cause those, it's intense. Yeah. Four minutes of side by side, door to door, you know, you can't nose to tail relax. racing. You can't relax at all. I mean, you got you're constantly doing something. Yep. Yeah. So you went up to you went up to race and raise and race yeah. and raise doing a good job up there. Mm -hmm. That's all loose dirt. 
I was just so shocked, dude. It was like we went into the middle of the woods somewhere, and when I got there, it was like <laughs> some tent city had appeared on a Wednesday night, and then I just yeah. got, I just got stuck there watching it and enjoying it. I, I I really enjoyed it. Was it was fun? I would like to see it on your track where it's t- where it's uh, tight packed and see what the difference is. Yeah, they uh, they're in NASCAR country up there, so they got to do it midweek to try to get the mm-hmm. the team members that work on the cars and crews and. Um, even some of the, the NASCAR drivers, uh, for them to, to get any of those guys out there, uh, like Wednesday in Charlotte is like everyone's, it's the day before they load and leave for, for big mm-hmm. races. So everyone's got, you know, that's their last day for, for that kind of fun. Right. I mean, it was definitely a good vibe. I mean, everybody was having fun. They were drinking some beer. They had their whole families there. There was like vendors set up selling these. Bo- I, and I think the thing that about Dirt Oval that appeals to me is the scale look of the cars. Because I'm big into scale, but I, 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 if I lived in the states, man, I would definitely be running dirt oval. Yeah, it's fun. It's a good time. It's definitely a very small segment of RC. It is not. Um, it's not mainstream. Um, it's it's the it's the smallest, probably the smallest niche within our niche. I I would say so, but I mean, it seems to be growing. It's popular. I mean, it's it's. I I don't know. Like I mean, I talk to Max once in a while, and he seems to be always going to some oval race somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I I think um, I think that it could grow. Uh-huh. Um, like I said, I I think it's just kind of still it, it's just stuck in its ways. I think it's a little bit old, um, antiquated, a little outdated. Needs a needs a, a freshening up, in my opinion. But. Um, you know, I'm not. I don't think I'm the guy to do it. I, yeah. I would love to. You're busy to be enough, part of dude. It. You're busy enough. Which yeah. bring, which brings us into our next topic. Here is like I don't know how you do it on a daily basis. You must be drink like um, coffee laced with Red Bull or something because you're always going. And you know, we talk daily. But I mean, this year you was really busy. You uh, you sponsored the nationals, which was really big for you. You have the Assault RC. Which is your 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 brand that you're doing like aftermarket parts and small things, which is really cool. <clears throat> you got your you had like three big races, <clears throat> excuse me, three big races like basically a month or three weeks apart. And of course, you got to deal with me and and Joseph on a daily basis and became our JQ USA racing uh, JQ Racing USA distributor. But let's talk about like you sponsoring the nationals because. Uh, that was pretty big for you, like, and we enjoyed the nationals. It was hot, and you know we we probably drank too much Fireball the first night. But dude, you was <laughs> everywhere. Like you was like if you wasn't in the trailer, you was out taking pictures. Your car won the concourse, and you raced. Like I was like, how can this guy do this? Like, so it's but yeah, let's talk about that. What made you decide to sponsor the nationals? Um. Well, I uh, let's just say I. I want to be involved, man. I, that's that's the main thing is we uh, we're active. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not just a hobby shop. We do have a website that's you know that has been doing very well. Um, <clears throat> we we have drivers uh, that we help out that were down there and we wanted to support. Um, you know, at that time, you know, we were just getting ready to launch the JQ distributorship, so that was huge to be able to to be around all mm-hmm. the racers that uh, support the brand. Um, but you know, Brian, um, Brian Lewis and Lance have come up to my shop and, uh, raced or Lance has announced and, um, they, I've been involved with those guys for a long time. Um, we help each other out whenever, whenever possible. And, uh, he sent me an email when, when they announced it saying mm-hmm. that they were going to have, uh, the Nats and, uh, would I want to be part of the sponsorship or, you know, would I want to sponsor it? And, um, when I saw the levels, I was like, yes, I want, uh, I want to be one of the top two, you know, I was like, sign me up. Okay. And, uh, so, I mean, instantly I, I, I bet I, the email came in, I bet it wasn't two minutes later. I sent back, sign me up for one of, you know, whatever's available at the top level. Really? Um, so it, I just knew I wanted to do it. Um, it was close enough for me to be involved and, um, and, and actually be involved, not just, you know, put some banners up. Um, yeah. And I think it went real well. It, it definitely, um, increased our, our traffic. It definitely, uh, got the awareness of our brand out there. 
And, um, you know, moving forward, it was, uh, it was definitely the right decision financially and, uh, you know, historically for our, for the, for the website brand. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was great. Like, I mean, you had your banners all up on the, I really like how they did it at Southside and had the banners all around the track. And I mean, that's all I saw was Beach RC and then we had the flags flying everywhere. And, and like, I mean, you did, you guys did a really good job. Like, like I said, I don't know how you raced, uh, done, went around taking pictures, taking video and supported everybody. I thought it was great. Uh, my first nationals, um, I was just scared about alligators attacking me and stuff like that, but you know, it was fine. Um, but I, I had a bunch of help, you know, that's and, true too. And that's a, that's, what's so awesome about what we've got going on right here is we've got a, a fantastic team. Um, you know, down there, uh, James Van Hook, he mm -hmm. also raced, but he, he was there to help me. He, uh, he's always around. He, he does the BK servo team management. Yes. And, um, and he knows my business pretty well. He's up here quite a bit. So, you know, to have somebody that's willing to step in and allow me to do those type of things is it's invaluable. Yes. Um, and, and to, just to touch on Southside, they did an amazing job. Like, yeah. I don't know any other track in the country outdoor that has put up that type of an atmosphere I don't, I've not been to DNC. I know that that's just an amazing event. Um, I've been to, you know, all, most of the, the race time entertainment stuff and I've been to a lot of big races. They rolled out the red carpet yep. for Nats yep. down there. And, uh, <laughs> anyone that didn't get to go, you missed what I would consider one of the better Nats that, uh, I've either watched or been to over the past, you know, so many. And, uh, they, Brian and his crew, like hands down, deserve nothing but respect oh man it's such such a great job they worked their butts off i mean it was so crazy it was you know the weather was crazy and they rolled those tarps out and they put them back on and they swept it all off and to be honest they had to make hard decisions but i think everybody got their racing in um i i i took i tip my hat to those guys because it wasn't easy and you know pleasing everybody is definitely not easy it's impossible and they did a great job with what they had. So I, I'm 100% in agreement with you. Yeah, fantastic. They, they deserve it. And we forgot to mention that James is actually a pretty badass 3D helicopter pilot. He is. And we've got <laughs> – I've got um, – I've, I've not released it because of time restraints. But uh, when we went down for the Nats warm-up, we had a, a fireball Friday night. Oh, boy. And um, we got – super wasted i forget everyone who was there um but anyways part of it, they just released the um the sab fireball uh mm -hmm. which is a, a smaller 3d helicopter and james had it on him and uh we uh he went out there and and was flying it it was awesome he was like up and down doing all this 3d stuff and you know for people that don't see it every day it's like wow it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. and uh I videotaped every last second of it. I got an awesome video I need to make, but he, uh, he blew that. He, he touched down on the ground and it, it lifted back up and then I, the canopy must've come loose and it got into the props and that thing blew up into a hundred pieces, man, just boom, right in the air. And all, all we could do was just laugh. He was so devastated, but we were all so drunk that it, it didn't matter. It was so hilarious. I, I can't wait to finally put that video out, but I got to do it soon. It's yeah, I'm going to do that. I too many see. videos. <clears throat> I want to see that. So let's – um, we move on. You did the Nationals. Then you had your, your Dixie Oval, which we touched on. Masters of Dirt, which was your big off-road race that you have every year. And how did that go for you? Masters was awesome. Yeah. Um, it's – every year it's getting better. Um, we learn – <coughs> excuse me we learn uh new things to to make it better every year and and to try to keep it up in the forefront of bigger um races to kick off the indoor season mm -hmm. um dustin evans won his second uh consecutive master of dirt title and uh this year we instituted a stock master title which frank denny ended up winning barely edging out um chad eubanks but it's just a growing event with some really cool titles. It's overall titles. It's it, you have to participate in three events or more, three classes or more, um, specific classes. And, um, uh, I think the titles are becoming a little bit more sought after and, 
Um, it's a homegrown event. It's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's not a roar event. Right. Um, it, it's a, it's a beach RC event. We, we've made these titles prestigious and we we're, we're making it bigger and better every year. So, um, it's one of those things like I, I want everyone to participate obviously. And uh, we'd love to see all the names go for that title. Cause I, I have a feeling at some point it's going to be one of those titles that everybody wished they had won. So, yeah, I think it's cool, man. I mean, once again, it comes back to what you keep putting back into RC, and I, I think definitely think you're reaping the awards with that. Um, so Masters of Dirt, and then recently, <clears throat> excuse me, INS, which I know you was like super excited about, like the INS race, uh, J Concepts race, and you had all the big shots there racing. Tell us about that because I haven't even I've talked to you briefly about it, but I mean I know like you're happy about that. Yeah, I mean, it it went fantastic. Um, I think. You know, when you put on an event like that, you see, well, I don't know how other people approach it, but I personally don't want it to suck. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we tried to make sure we covered all of our bases. Um, we, we tried to make sure that uh, no stone was left unturned. So um, to have the caliber of driver and, and teams that were here, um, for them to all leave uh, what I feel like in a very happy and satisfied manner that uh, it proves that hard work will pay off um i think we could have done a lot better uh i'm never satisfied with you know just making everyone happy i want people to be pumped and, and want to come back but the event went awesome um jason rona and, and the j concept guys they they came and, and they allowed us to to do what we do they didn't come in you know like this is what we want and mm -hmm. they allowed us to be beach rc and and do things the way we do it um, and, uh, overall experience was amazing. Uh, the racing was great. The talent was off the chain. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, I'm looking forward to next year's already. Um, and, uh, hoping that, uh, we can just keep on improving our game. What did the, uh, what did the pro guys have to say about your track? You know, early on, I, I kind of heard some rumbles, you know, we, we hear this, this thing about, being the square track, you know, uh -huh. we, we have a, we have a square track, not a rectangle track. It's, it's a little bit long, deeper than it is wide. And that's, that's, that's not normal, you mm -hmm. know, in indoor RC tracks. It's unconventional. Um, so I heard the rumblings of it being the square track and, and, but it, it, everyone caught on quick. I mean, when you got guys like Mayfield and Cavallari, Rifkin, these, these guys, and Evans, they, they're pros like they catch on instantly two laps they're done they, they already know what they need they already know how to lay out um so ultimately i think uh i think they all left with a good taste in their mouth i i didn't hear any negative feedback um i think it went real good i, I think they were happy yeah i haven't heard anything either i mean i i think um i really like um the ins series I really like J Concepts and what Rona does anyway. Rona's similar. Uh, you and Rona are very similar as they put a lot of money back into the hobby as well with things like his race series and whatnot. And I'm just well chuffed that you actually got to hold that and have all those guys there. So along with your Masters of Dirt, your Dixie Nationals and that, I think you're going to see a – I hope to, that you see a big increase in, in what you do there and people can, can appreciate it more. So – but definitely a good series. Oh, I, I I should have stayed. I really wish I would have stayed after Full Roll. And, and just I've never really watched uh, competitive 10 scale like that. And I would have just been – I would have loved just to come on and watch this guy's race and battle it out. Who was your favorite? Who did you want to win everything? Let's be truthful. Oh, man. You're putting me on the spot. Oh, um, yes. I've always been a fan of Mayfield. I, I think he's just a cool dude. Um, I like how he's uh, basically, you know, kind of like a racer's racer, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and, and I got to spend a little bit of time with Rifkin prior to the race. Um, man, it's so tough because Panda is a good friend of mine. I would love to see him have some success at that higher level. And uh, I, I know I'm dancing around the fire right now. Um, and, but in and Dustin Evans being a, a Denver Broncos fan, oh, um, God. man, I, I'm a, uh, I'm torn. I, I guess if I was going to choose somebody to win uh, who I want to win sentimentally would have been 
Max and uh, who I thought or would have picked to win would have been um, Mayfield. Okay. But uh, I think ultimately the right people won. Tessman mm-hmm. was off the chain fast, man. Him and Tessman and, and Evans found something after A1, and those two – figured it out i mean they were like lightning fast yeah. come a2 and a3 a um, little bit of luck on their side and they probably both would have you know it, the, 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 it could have been a little bit different yeah well you know testman is i i say this all the time testman and gord are the best team in rc and he he has a way of figuring it out and getting it done and i think that just comes down to being uh just the fine details and making sure everything's done properly. So I'm not surprised that he's doing, and he's doing really well uh, this year in, in 10 scale. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to Reedy race here coming up. So it should be great. But um, yeah, they've been concentrating on the 10 scale stuff, you know, post worlds mm-hmm. and uh, knowing that the worlds are at x-rays factory next year. I mean, yep. they're obviously wanting to make uh they want to win that one as bad as anything. I'm sure. So. Yeah, and I like Rifkin too. I had a chat with him at Fall Brawl. He said he's going to come on the podcast. Hopefully, I can get him on here. I like. I got some things I want to talk to him about that I think I think are pretty cool. So we'll see. I think all these pro guys aren't going to come talk to me to after come on the podcast and talk to after silly season, which I'm super excited for and ready to geek out on myself. So with that being yeah. said, uh, Assault RC, let's talk about your your brand that you're building. I think it's pretty cool. You got some some nice. Uh, you got some really good tool holders. You know what they're they're really good for too. They're so heavy. So if I hit Joseph in the head with them when at a race, he'll pay attention. Absolutely, they yes. they were made to dual purpose for uh, yeah. flapjacking and holding tools for yeah. sure. I almost threw it. I almost threw mine at him in, at uh, the Southern Nets countless times. <laughs> so yeah. so t- talk to us about Assault RC. Some of the products you got going on and. Uh, what what made you decide to do this? Well, Salt RC is uh, a brand that uh, that it's just it, it's been kind of festering and building over the last few years. Um, like I told you before, I was in a manufacturer manufacturing setting prior to this business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, try to innovate and have some things that'll help our brand. But we're also trying to build a hobby shop brand of products that will sell good in a hobby shop and produce margins. Right. And, um, you know, like most of our stuff is like a 50% margin, which is almost unheard of, um, in this business. Um, so, you know, that's what we're trying to build, but also come up with some proprietary and unique items that are going to be, you know, sought after by the racers and, and the pros that, you know, for tools that are tools or items that are going to be needed and useful. That's, that's what we're trying to come up with. We're releasing a new shock tool um, next Friday. Um, oh yeah, a, w- a week That's from cool. today. So we're looking forward to the possibility of uh, a really hot item, and uh, we got some other things we're working on. So it's just a once again, man, it's a labor of love. Just trying to come up with some products that are going to either make things better or that haven't been thought of, um, and just come out with a, a good look and. Um, streamline some stuff. Good, good for the hobby shops is what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, you got you got a nice logo there, and the products that I've seen, I'm excited to see your shock your shock too as well. You talk you talked to me about that when we was there, and hopefully, um, we get some of those assault RC products in here, and we're gonna do some giveaways with our patreons of the podcast here, so get it spread the love a little bit. Absolutely, we're yeah. we're gonna send you guys a care package here pretty soon, um, I, especially after next Friday. We'll. We'll get you some of the new stuff out and some tool holders and charge leads. We got a bunch of cool stuff. Yeah, the the tool holders are really good. I mean, I, I I'm sorry, they're just badass. Like uh, red aluminum or black aluminum. They're they're heavy. They don't tip over. I mean, they hold multiple tools. I use mine all the time, and I like my uh, pit mat that I got at Fall Brawl too. Even though I don't race anymore and I don't really wrench, it's still cool to have. <laughs> so. Um, you guys look out for Soda RC from Beach RC, and we'll have some other swag to do some Patreon giveaways here in 2019. Now let's move on to the to my my favorite subject with you because it's so funny how this happened. Um, obviously, you're now the JQ Racing USA distributor. Uh, that's I'm I'm so grateful of that. You've you've made my life a lot easier. But it's so funny how this came about. 
uh, when I met you last year at Fall Bro, I remember like having the shot of Fireball and I looked around and I was like, hey man, you should have some JQ racing parts on this in this trailer. And I remember your response. You was like, man, you know, I really like JQ. I don't really agree with most of his opinions, but you know, the, the, everybody's entitled to their opinions. But I can't have JQ racing stuff in my shop. So then it went from, I was like, all right, cool. I get it. I've heard that before. And then it went to, all right, I'm going to hold some, I'm going to get some parts. And then it went to, now you're the, the, like the distributor, which is freaking awesome. Like, like, how did that happen? That's, you know, you, you, what made you decide to do this? (laughs) Um, well, (laughs) business, man. I mean, no one, not everyone's going to agree with uh, Joseph. Um, not everyone's going to agree with the Republicans or the Democrats, and not everyone's going to agree with me. Yep. So, um, when I started thinking about the possibility of a brand that has potential, um, good product, and a, a diehard, um, you know, customer base, uh, I, I when we first started selling the product. I just realized like these people love the brand and there's more people out there that just don't know about it yet. And I think it's unfortunate that people have such a bad, uh, outlook on Joseph. I mean, I had it for a little while until I kind of read between the lines. Um, I think ultimately people want to think what they think based off of, you know, a misconstrued perception. But Mm -hmm. I mean, let's not let let's be honest. I mean, right. he's a dick. He's yes. a, he's a total dick. Online, but he's a he's he's an asshole. But. He is such an asshole. But the fact of the matter is, is he is smart. He has a good product. He doesn't hate America beyond contrary belief to belief. Um, I, I think ultimately he's he just if he would just keep the damn mouth shut, so many more people would love his product. <laughs> but. You know, he, he's a good guy yeah. and, and he's really smart and the product is really good. So ultimately I made my decision based on that, um, based on the fact that people were asking me to carry it. It, it wasn't, it wasn't the decision I made like thinking, no, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance. I, it was a decision that I, I carefully thought through and, um, but yeah, I, I was, I was hell bent not carrying it. It's so funny. Did you by chance watch the the Marks uh what's his Santa Santa Marks, Maria? Yeah, Max Santa Maria. Santa Only Maria time. his yeah. his um his YouTube vlog uh-huh. yesterday about uh what like like the teams that he was thinking about going to. Yes. And then so uh, it really caught my attention when I was watching that. He uh <laughs> he said, "Oh, let's not forget JQ." He's like, you know, basically said the same thing. He's smart and da 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 and uh, he's like, "I just I don't want bad publicity. He says it could be bad for me in the, on the publicity side or, you know, people might think differently of him if he ran a JQ. And that's so funny because that's exactly how I felt. Yeah. That's a hundred percent how I felt a year ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm here to tell him and whoever people, if people look down on you because of the car you drive for one, they're knuckleheads. Yeah. I mean, they shouldn't look down on you for the car you drive. Everyone has their opinion. It shouldn't be, you know, if, if you're a straight jerk at the racetrack, I'm probably not going to like you too much. Mm-hmm. But if, if you drive a JQ or an S works or whatever car that, you know, is not this popular brand, um, I don't look down on you for that. No one should look down on you for that. You know, buddies are going to bench race and they're going to talk crap to each other. But if anyone thinks that you're any, a bad person because you drive a certain brand, they're knuckleheads and, and screw those people. Yeah. Uh, now making a decision, you know, he kept on preaching in that podcast. He's going to make a decision based on 10th scale, you know, having 10th scale cars or, uh, you know, good brands with good teams. I get that. You know, if, if he didn't make a decision based on, you know, if he wanted to go somewhere because of that, I, I get that 100 percent. But he def- no one should make a decision on JQ product because of JQ. I, I am. The more you start thinking about it, the more crazy that just seems yeah you know. uh, unfortunately um i i you know we deal with joseph on a daily basis via text and it's very difficult but just like mark said once you get to see him and meet him in person he's a different person but you know he has his opinions he's been like this since forever i mean yes i want him to calm down but when it comes to his car and his passion what he's doing i don't think there's 
I, I mean, there's really nobody in the hobby doing what he's doing right now. Maybe, okay, X-Ray. Uri, Uri is, he's he's got his own company. He's building a car. He's been doing it since the 70s. But, I mean, Joseph is still racing his car. He's he's developing it constantly. He's constantly testing. And he openly shares his knowledge. I mean, he kind of changed the game here last year with his Facebook Lives, his his blogs. And, yeah, people, it's, it's like this. Either you love him or you love to hate him, but you cannot take away his knowledge and what he does for people, especially when he gets to a track and helps everybody out. I think once people get over this, whole, his whole Facebook persona and realize in person that he really is a good guy, they'll, they'll, they'll see the difference. Like at tracks, he's, he's awesome. The cars are good. The team atmosphere is great. I mean, we try to, we try to, I don't want to turn this into a promote JQ podcast, but we try to do things different and we try to treat everybody that everybody that runs our cars we we treat them as family or that that they matter from the guy who who crashes every lap to the guy who can you know do the fastest lap at the track and and Joseph does that too so with that yeah, said I, I think there's a misconception and and I mean if you think I, I don't know he's he's not as bad as people want to think he is I you know I I I read posts all the time when he posts something and then there's someone that there's always the guy um not a certain specific person, but there's always a guy, a person in his, in his, you know, comments that say no one should support his product. Mm -hmm. He's an asshole. No one should support his product. He hates America, but those people don't know him. And, um, and like you said, this isn't to promote the JQ brand. This is just me telling everybody, look, I felt that way too, but you know, I took the time to not, not just bash him for his political views or his, uh, you know, his yeah, and you know what? Thinking. You know what? And like, if people get tired of Joseph, just send me ten bucks, and I'll kick him in the nuts like every time for every ten bucks you send me. That's my job. So shit, you're about to get rich. Yeah, I don't mind. You know, hey, <laughs> and we'll take it. We'll videotape it. But enough about JQ racing. I think I, I'm really excited about 2019 working with you and Lucas and everybody there, and I think it's it's gonna be great. So I'm excited about that. Let's talk about something we always talk about a lot too. And that's like, what's your opinion on, we have so many different uh, opinions on the state of RC at the moment and how things, like, where do you stand on that? What's your opinion on RC right now? Our, our niche. What, what do you think is going on? What do you think we need to do? What do you think can change it? Um, I think that's a loaded question. I, I think that there's so much good and, and there's, there is a good amount of bad. Um, you know, there, there's a, there's a large percentage of people that are doing this for the wrong reasons. And I, and I think that everyone should be goal oriented. Everyone should want to be, you know, a world champion or a national champion or their track champion because you don't compete to lose. Uh-huh. That, that's a hundred that's percent. If you're competitive, you compete to win. But this hobby is founded on having fun. It, it's about guys getting together and racing. I mean, people can go and bash and, and have a good time without competing and just hit jumps and go mudding and all that. But, you know, at our level and in, in our in, in this segment of RC, the racing side, it still should be about spending time with your buddies, spending time with your family um, still should be about. The hard-earned money you're spending, you should get a return out of, and that return shouldn't always be, I have to win, or I'm not going to get a sponsor, or I have to win to feel good about it. It should be, I'm spending this money because I enjoy doing this hobby. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the biggest misconception. And what's wrong is people feel like if I spend this much money, I have to win, or I have to do good, or mm-hmm. I need a sponsor so I can do more. And I think that's where our biggest problems lie right now um i think the hobby's in a really good position to succeed um i think it's pretty good right now the economy is good um from what we're seeing you know it's an upswing but i i think the state of the hobby is good i just i just wish my my biggest thing is i just wish people would do it for the right reasons and and that is to have fun spend time with your your buddies especially bench race your loved ones um, your family, you know, if you're doing it with your dad, you know, it's a father, son or, you know, whatever it is, 
it needs to be more fun. If you're not walking off that driver's stand laughing about, you know, talking about how you almost passed this guy in the air or, you know, you, whatever it might be, whatever your situation. And I, I just feel like you're not doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's, that's good points. I think, uh, actually I was talking to my buddy Will about this last night and we, I, I, I definitely think people have to club race more and, and, you know, I, and people be like, well, you, you, you like RCGP and that's going to be another big race. And that's something I'll touch on in a bit. But I think one of the things I don't, I think, <clears throat> Okay, this is how I'll put it. I think people are out there trying, everybody thinks they're going to be professional and make a living doing this hobby. And they have to understand that there's only a handful of people that actually do this for a living and make a good living of it. There's, there's probably 10 people that make a good, uh, make a living off this. It's probably a little bit more. But out of those 10, there's probably five that make a very good living. So, I mean, just because... I think people have the misconception, okay, I'm going to get sponsored, I'm going to do this, I'm going to I'm going to go to this race and I'm going to beat this guy and I'm going to be a pro the next day. That's not how it works. I mean, these guys are pros for a reason because they have the talent, they put in the work and and it's not an easy thing. I think people need to get back to enjoy it. like you said, just get back to enjoying it, going to these races, having fun because I have fun going to these races. Yes, we want, we all want to win, but I just think, I think as long as people feel that there's that faint little bit of hope that they can they can be a pro, it's it's probably one of the biggest issues we have in here. Instead of trying to be a pro, just have fun. If you're gonna be a pro, it's gonna happen if you put in the work. Yeah, and I, I've told all all the guys at my shop, we've got some really really talented young kids that are up and coming here, and some of them have some pressure from their parents, and and, and some of them don't. And I tell them all. If you're having fun, you're going to do better. Mm-hmm. So if you take the pressure off and just enjoy what you're doing, you'll see better results. And once you start letting that pressure get to you is when you start, you know, having issues, start not succeeding or or a, a mechanical failure is compounded in, in a much more, uh, you know, major way in their opinion. Like they feel like they failed or whatever. And that's that stuff happens. I mean, yep. we race. We we this is competition this isn't a uh you know we're not drawing pictures and getting participation awards we're trying to win Mm -hmm. um so i understand that part but you're right club racing um you know we we hold uh uh, before the ins came we held two major races a year fall and spring and we you know so we try to club race the rest of the time Mm -hmm. And um, we try to promote the fact that, you know, if you have a local hobby shop, you should support them. You should buy it. We've always said, you know, our motto with Beach RC has always been support your local hobby shop, then think of us next. Um, You know, we don't want people to travel three weeks out of the month or two weeks out of the month and not race the other two weeks. I'd rather see people club race four weeks out of the month than travel to these big races. I mean, Mm -hmm. Not I, kudos to people for making money off of big races, but you know when you're dealing with 600 or a thousand entries in some of these bigger events, I mean the money you've got to spend to be competitive or to go to these races is astronomical, and yep. it's it's definitely taken away from the club racing, and and that's not good for tracks. Tracks tracks cannot succeed and stay open if they're not getting people coming and racing and. With everybody on sponsorship deals, they're buying their parts directly from the manufacturers, or you know they're you know they're somehow, some way getting it in a roundabout way, and ultimately, it's going to cost the hobby shop. And we've seen since I've been open in North South Carolina and Georgia, we've probably seen in in five years, we've probably seen at least five, maybe ten hobby shops with tracks closed down. Right, there there has been a lot of shops closed in the in the. And tracks closed on in the Carolinas. Yeah, and that's because they're not being supported. Most of it is because they're not being supported. And another part of – I've always said this as well is if you don't treat your – if your hobby shop and track or your track is just a a fun business or a side business, at some point it's going to fail. If you don't treat it like 100% your business, it's – 
you're not going to succeed with it. It, it will fail at some point. Yeah. And that's what people don't understand. You can't just because you have some money, you just can't open up a track and expect people to come to it. Yeah. You, you got to plan out what you're doing, you know, and, and I'm not even the best at it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not. I know there's so much more I could do to make our, our place better. Um, but like you, you've alluded to earlier, I'm just spread so thin. We do so much already. Um, so it's, it's tough. I think, I think another, f- and I know like we're calling the, the pot calling the kettle black saying that about sponsorships and we actually, you know, we do it at JQ, but if we don't do it, we'll, it's not that I don't want to do it. I, I just think that we, I think we offer a great value for what we do as well. It's just part, it's the nature of the beast of the, of the industry right now. If we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. I, I think another big problem is, which I've seen in the Carolinas, is the, it's more focused on building more tracks than actually getting more people involved. And I think yep. that stems from a guy that maybe goes to a track, he gets pissed off, he doesn't like that this track's this, and he goes, oh, I can do things better. So he goes down and he got a little plot of land and opens up a track, like an hour away. Who does that hurt? It hurts everybody in that area. You don't need another track. You need more people involved. And the only way we're going to do that is like, it's, wow, I could go on my whole, my whole other spiel that I don't feel like going on because I've said it enough, but I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of, I think there needs, like we have professionals in RC, but I think they actually have to be professional. I think there has to be a line between professional and the regular guy. That way we get a little bit more clarity in what's going on here in the hobby. Just like any other motorsport. And people will say, well, this isn't a sport. This isn't a motorsport. You don't physically get in the car. Yes, you don't physically get in the car, but it's still a, a motorsport of some some, some sense. It, it requires knowledge. It requires uh, talent, reflexes, and every, everything, anything else involved in motorsports. So for me, it is a form of motorsports. And every form of motorsports has a professional level that people can either watch and enjoy or they try to attain that level and become one of those pros. Well, right. two two things to what you just said. First thing about the pot calling, calling the kettle black about sponsorships. You're right in a sense that, you know, it, it, it kind of could be considered hypocritical because we may have to do the same thing. But you have to adapt to what's going on in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for a while I was complaining a little bit about the same situation. Like, oh, everyone's sponsored. <laughs> and and that is that's very true. I mean, almost everybody is sponsored. You could race three club races, put in a resume somewhere, and the next thing you know, this guy's got a a fifty percent deal from the company. Mm-hmm. But that's it's not about that as much as it is is about the companies adapting and figuring out ways to generate sales with those people, regardless of what their sponsorships are. Yes, um, you know, pros. Having, you know, a Mayfield at your track or an Evans or any of these top guys, they don't pay the bills. Mm-hmm. So having them as part of your weekly racing program is not is not necessarily the best thing for you. The best thing for you is as many of the Joes as possible. Yep. And people racing, you know, we have a stock slash class here. And that generally turns into somebody bumping up into a, a 17.5 buggy or a mod buggy or whatever. And that's. Those are the kind of people hobby shops need to go for. So yes. that being said, you know, we have to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand and the margins get decreased as an industry mm-hmm. and we can all uphold the value of, of every brand. Yes. Uh, as a, I sell every brand here. I, I don't have, um, you know, I, I, for the most part, I have no allegiance to any brand. I sell what sells. I try to keep in stock what people need or want. And to me, that's part of the success. You can't sell what mm-hmm. you don't have. So I, I just feel like people need to adapt. And, and, and if you, it goes back to me saying that if it's not your main source of income or if you don't have somebody that cares about it running it for you that's going to you know, figure everything out, you're not going to be able to sell product to people and they're going to go elsewhere. Yep. So. I, I, I want to touch on something that you said, too, about maybe getting like a Mayfield or Evans to your track for one of your big races. I think I think there's too much. I, I say this all the time. Uh, what's better, like Roxon and Anderson go into some race somewhere catering to 100 people where nobody sees it or 
Roxin and Anderson and all the other guys competing weekly in Supercross and every, everyone around the world watching it. I think when you send two people to a, to this guy who wants to have a big race and he w- wants these guys to come in to get to get uh, entries and he brings in two pros and probably nobody's going to... And it's nice. Don't get me wrong. It's really nice to have the pros there. They can help and, you know, they get to mingle and that, that shouldn't stop. But I think that is one of the problems that we have with too many people trying to have actual big races and then they take these like you know take these two pros or one pro and they get them to a race and they come and you know i'd rather see those pro guys race each other and 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 follow it myself that's my opinion but you know i don't know i just think uh i think that's an issue too if you if if you stop trying to everybody stop trying to have a big big race and getting one or two pros to come attend and focus more on just what you said having the, the average guys come in and have a fun day of racing and like yeah, it can be a big race. It can be a big race without a pro as well. So absolutely, yeah. But that's my spiel. You know, I'm I'm all about RCGP. Thoughts on that, real quick. Um, I think it could be huge uh, if it's done properly and if they can follow through and get people on board. I think it could be uh, a good step in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been involved in major motorsports uh, prior to you know my my tenure here in the RC business and uh, I uh, I understand it pretty well and I think it could be a very good beneficial series and um, marketing tool for for the hobby but let's not get that confu- that I I don't think it's going to I, I I don't think it's going to be an overnight success no of course I, not it's gonna take some time it's gonna take some work I think they've you know, between Joseph and Scotty Ernst and his, his Scott McCullen and whoever else is involved, I think they're, I think they've got the right team. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some more people added to this at some point, but, um, yeah, I think it, I think it could be huge. I just, I hope people just don't write it off because JQ, um, uh, you know, is the brainchild of it. I, I hope they ultimately follow it and, uh, give it a year or two and, and, and let them show everybody that it's that how cool it can or will be yeah i i like to say this nothing's impossible until it's done and for change to actually happen change actually has to happen so we have to do i think we have to do something because if we keep trying to do the same things over and over again it's just just recycling we're just recycling the same guys we're not getting any any new people in and we have to figure that out somehow some way because i think i think rc is so awesome i think it's cool and I want people to know that as well. Plus the definition of insanity. Yeah. You know, uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different result. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, uh, we qualify too much. You know, yeah. I, I'd like to see the culture of qualifying kind of go into like one round of qualifying to basically seed you into, you know, a couple heads up races and then, you know, get some points from the heads up races and then you race your mains. Yep. So that way you're always racing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I understand racing the clock and learning the track and, and all that, but I mean, there's only so much, you know, a racer can take of not racing, you know, racing the person in front of you. Yep. I, I think a big thing, and uh, a lot of people will say, well, RC is not a spectator sport. I, I think, I, I, I think they're wrong. I think if you wa- if you've ever watched RC racing TV, uh, they cover all the, um, the events in Europe, like all the Afro events. And Nick Damon, he's really good. Like, he actually really calls uh, full-scale races as well. I think Nick Damon, and I like to see Nick Damon and Scotty Ernst do this, like call a race. But I think Nick Damon does one of the best jobs of calling a race for the average person ever. Like, somebody that doesn't even know what's going on. If you listen to him, you will understand what's going on. I've, I've watched people come on while we're watching it on YouTube, and they don't know anything about RC. They start, they listen to what he's saying. Some people will tell him in the comments what's going on and they're hooked. So I think commentating is a big thing for spectators and also so they know what's going on. Just, just thinking ahead because sometimes when you hear racer, I know like we're racers, so we just want to hear lap times, you know? I also thought Lance was good at calling a race too. He would make it exciting and I used to enjoy, like I enjoyed when he was at, uh, when I went to PMB and he called the race too. I think uh, a lot of things need to go into work to improve this hobby. And I, I think we just need to, like, make it cool and make it, like, like 
I tell people all the time. I tell you this. I think like we treat RC like an underground dog fighting uh, situation. Like you know, it's all. It seems like it's all underground. It's always in places where people can't come and see, and like we want to keep it hidden from the world or something. I don't think we should hide it. I think we should promote it, and we should we should let people see like, hey, this is toy cars. These are toy cars. Yes, but this happens and this works, and you can do this and that. And I think the more we do, the, the, when we start doing that more, the more people that will come in and, and, and buy cars and get involved. And then that makes everything better for everybody. The more people involved in it, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it can be a spectator sport, <laughs> but I think it could really only be a spectator sport at the top levels. I agree there, um, too. I don't think if you were to, you know, no one wants to watch our Wednesday night club racing week after week for but. You know the INS AAA mains were amazing. Yes. So you know, and so were our stock mains. I I, mean, I don't want to discount like the A mains of an event that size. All the A mains of an event like the INS or Masters or Psycho or Wicked or DNC. Yeah, I think at that at that level, you absolutely can create a spectator sport. Yeah. Um, but it, you know that's why I think RCGP it's so unique. It will it. The way they're doing it and trying to bring it, it's almost like it's basically like motocross, supercross racing with RC guys. And and that's the model there looks like they're using. I think it it could be very successful, Mm -hmm. Um, but people got to buy into it. They've they've got to, you know, they got to understand that this isn't a now thing. This is we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, it'll never happen. So I don't think people should brush it off. I don't think people should, you know, really. Uh, discount any part of it because of who's involved. You know, I mean, it's it's not Roar trying to create a World Series. You know, this is this is a new group of people trying to take the upper echelon of RC, the the biggest class of RC, and turn it into something that possibly could go viral and mainstream. And uh, they're the only ones willing to take the risk and and do the work. Yeah. So it shouldn't be discounted and people shouldn't, you know, just, you know, just shrug them off. Just be open minded. And, and let, I say this, if it works, if it if it ha- works and it changes RC and makes it everything better. Great. If it doesn't, there's nothing lost. Absolutely. That's exactly perfectly said, because why would you why would you knock something? It's like somebody. I, my daughter all the time, you know, she will put food on her plate. We'll set it in front of her. She's six. And she'll be like, Ooh, I don't like that. Yep. Well, how do you know? You haven't tried it. You haven't tried it. And, and I, I'm a, I'm a big, I, my whole life I've always said, I, I want to do everything once, you know, these, these kind of situations are not easy. It's hardship on the people doing it. It's a lot of work. And, uh, I think it could be great. I'm not saying it's going to be great. I think it has the potential to be great. I think the, if the drivers buy into it and the teams buy into it and they're willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to help, it's only a sacrifice in time. It's not going to be a lifelong it, – it's not going to end up bad for them. I think the only thing that they're going to come up with is a better place to showcase their talent maybe and hopefully make more money. And, uh, you know, it, we have to start somewhere. Rome wasn't built in a day. No, it wasn't. So. No, it was not. Um, all right. Well, we've been talking for about an hour and 15 minutes. I know you got lots of work to do, but we have to do the Fast Lane 10 question segment. All right. But I only could find nine questions for you. What? So, <laughs> I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out, but I, I think I'm going to make it up on the way as, as we do it. But let me do my introduction because this is one of our, our sponsors. So now we're going to go into the Fast Race 10 questions in 10 second segment. Fast Race is a world champion option parts brand made in Italy. Their drivers include David Angaro and Ricardo Berton, who I think are both coming to DNC, I hope. And they run innovative performing enhancements parts that Fast Race makes for most eight scale buggies. Most, not- most notably, sorry, I know I said that wrong. Their world famous honeycomb shock bladders and caps. So, Go to FastRaceShop.com, type in LEFTY2019 in all caps, and get 10% off your purchase. Now, let me pull up your questions here. All right. So we got 10 questions here, and you gotta you have to answer them like it like in one word or minimum. Like no, no, like whatever you say counts. Like 
We're not taking these back, right? <laughs> okay. So, all right. So number one, oval or ten scale off road? Oval. Number two, Myrtle Beach or Colorado? Myrtle Beach. Number three, fireball, hot or chilled? Oh, on ice. Okay. Number four, Manning, Manning or Elway? Elway. Wow. Number five, favorite form of motorsports? Oh. Uh, ding, ding, mid, ding, mid, ding, midgets. Ding. Midgets, okay. Number six, because this is you, because hat to the back or flat bill front? Hat to the back. Yeah, that's trucker, you. Trucker style. Trucker style, but you like the flat brim too. Like I like that too. Yep. All right. Moon landing, real or fake? 100% real. <laughs> uh, number nine, uh, number eight, sorry. Slicks in off-road. Yuck. Yeah. Okay. Let me get... Oh, I lost it. Hold on one second. Uh, do pink pinion gears make you faster? Number nine. Pink pinions matter. No, they don't. Uh, <laughs> number 10. Oh, man. Uh, let me think of something real quick. Modest stock. Oh, God. <sighs> mod. But you don't, do you run mod? I'm, I'm fixing to. Yeah. But the, here's, here's, and, and being that I answered it the way I did, I'll just explain real quick. It's, it's because that's in, in 10 scale electric, as you will call, uh, nitro, the, the, the glory. glory. That's two wheel mod is the glory in 10 scale. So, yeah. I think, uh, that's where it's at. But uh, thanks for answering those questions, the FastRaceShop.com questions. I appreciate it. Um, I really wanted to put one more in there. It was Astro or Dirt? Dirt, man. Come on. I know. Don't even, I know, don't I even know. ask that crap. I know. I know. But um, we're going to close out here. Is there anything you'd like to add before we uh, sign off? I don't know, Lefty. I'm, I just uh, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I think you're doing an awesome job. This podcast is kicking ass right now. Thank you. Uh, Every time I listen to it, I learn something, and the, your guests have been amazing. So I, I'm honored to be part of it, and uh, I really appreciate you for uh, what you're doing. And um, yeah, man, I, I'm looking forward to an awesome 2019. Um, traveling, gonna we're gonna do a lot more off road this year, a mm -hmm. lot less oval. Yeah, um, really gonna you know try to to grow the salt brand uh, assaultrc.com is if anyone wants to check it out we do got some new products coming out next week yep um i hope everybody has a super duper merry merry christmas and a happy new year hope everyone has a prosperous new year and uh yeah man just if anyone's around the area stop by and see us uh, we're we're here and we love talking with people we love helping people so looking forward to 2019 is lucas there yeah, you want to talk with him? Yeah, let me say what's up to him real quick. All right, hold on. Hey, Lucas, come here. He's tending to the front right now. Ah, uh, okay. Hey, the lefty wants to talk to you real quick. What's up, Lucas? How you doing, man? It's too close. Don't pop loud. Keenan. What's up, Lucas? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm cool, man. It's a lot of rain going on in Myrtle Beach. Yep, it's wet. Yeah, it's yeah. wet and raining. Are you all ready for the holidays, dude? I am. As ready as we're going to be. Cool. I'm going to get you here on the podcast with me one day so we can talk so, you know, talk about RC and have some fun. Right. But I just wanted to say what's up. Everybody, this is Lucas Lauren. He's the hardest working guy at Beach RC. Hey, everybody. All right, dude. Talk to you later, man. Have a good all day. Right, bye bye. All right. All right, Brentis. Well, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate all that you do. Um, you have a good Christmas. I'm sure we'll be talking before that. And um, hey, man, keep it snowflake, man. That's all I got to say to you. Keep it <laughs> pink snowflake. Pink pinions matter. Yeah, pink pinions and pretty cars. <laughs> That's right. All right, man. All right. Take care. Talk to you later, man. Later. Bye-bye. All right, guys, that concludes our episode for tonight. Thanks for tuning in to the No Name RC Podcast, Episode 7 with Brent. Dansford, Beach Nation, baby. With that said, thank you guys for your support. Uh, I'm looking forward to our podcast before Christmas. It's going to be a pretty interesting guest. Uh, all I have to say is that all the king will join us, so that should be pretty cool. If you don't know who the king is, then I don't know. You're going to have to get your books out and start searching the internet. 
There's only one king in RC. So I'm f looking forward to that. Thanks, Brent, for coming on. Remember, guys, BeachRC.com for all your RC needs. Brent will get you hooked up. Uh, thanks, Lucas, for coming on as well. Uh, I'm going to do a podcast with Lucas because Lucas is, is pretty awesome. He's got some cool things to say. With that said, guys, I know it's winter time. It's not much uh, eight scale racing going on. So I hope you're having fun running 10 scale. Hopefully it's indoor and it's not too bad. If you are running eight scale, I know it's probably muddy and rainy. But hey, man, just keep racing. Keep having fun. And remember, if it ain't fun, it ain't worth it. Lefty out. This is the ridiculous one, Jay Smoker, and you're listening to the No Name RC Podcast. Ridiculous! Woo! Thank you for listening to the No Name RC Podcast. Please tune in next time for more fresh RC content. And if you can, please also support us on patreon.com forward slash the Quay Grain. We will greatly appreciate it. And don't forget, Nitro is the glory.